Hey everyone, Gil Gross here, and it is time for another mailbag where I answer your observations, your questions, your hot takes, ultimately your comments about tennis or anything else. Well over 24 hours ago, I posted in the YouTube community tab, you guys are on fire recently. So many comments. I pulled 22 of them. There's no way I'm going to get to all 22. That's just how it works. But the fact that I pulled 22 means that there was a lot of good ones. I also tried something new this week, and I'm going to talk, you know, I'm going to say it now uh, because I'm going to do the same thing for next week. I said on the on the community tab post that if you leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts with your mailbag question, I guarantee I will answer it. Didn't really work. I only got one. I did get some reviews, which I appreciate that didn't include a mailbag question. Uh, but I only got one that was a review, you know, that that five-star rating and a mailbag question. I will get to that, obviously. Uh, but same thing goes for next week. So if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, uh, maybe you aren't so good at keeping up with the YouTube community tab. tab. I know that some of you guys say that it's difficult to actually uh, catch. Uh, if you're one of those people, that's your chance. So you can do that, and I will get to it next week. Let's get into it. All right. First one is from a username that is very long and hard to say. I'm going to go with Konijin. All right. Hey, Gil. My question is about the long-term development of Yannick and Carlos. How much development do you think both of them have left? And would you say that Alcaraz has more development left in him because he is younger or that Sinner has more development left because his game is less complete, both technically and physically? I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, for me, it's definitely the latter. Juan Carlos Ferrero, Alcaraz's coach, has discussed and and made statements like, oh, Carlitos is only at 50% of his potential. These are great things for JCF to say. They sound good, and they might be true. But can my brain comprehend that? Not really. I can't see or understand all that missing potential for Alcaraz because he is so complete. There are nitpicks. There are areas where he can get better, sure. No doubt about it, uh, but that pales in comparison to what I see in Yannick Sinner, a guy who probably can still get a lot stronger physically, continues to be a work in progress in that area, a guy who doesn't volley all that well, doesn't have a great backhand slice, uh, is trying to develop the forehand drop shot. That is still rough at this point. Backhand drop shot, I don't think he's really reached into, into that bag. Uh, I don't think he's even really attempted to develop that shot. That's there for him. The serve is really getting there. You know, that's a, that's a shot that might be at 80% of its potential, maybe even 90% of its potential at that point. I don't know. But that's been something that's been a constant work in progress. So it seems like Sinner has a lot to go. Plus, there's still the, how is Yannick going to react in a major final? How is he going to react if he gets to world number one? Like, there's all of those mental questions that Alcaraz is already starting to work through. You know, he had a lot of issues with, in my estimation, pressure after that incredible run in, I'll call it Q1 and Q2 of 2022. So up until winning Madrid, I'd say. I think coming into Roland Garros after that massive Madrid, all the expectations, he struggled with that. I think he struggled with it. And he understood and accepted his struggles with that and started to work through it mentally. So he's even found some solutions and done some important learning in that aspect. That too is all ahead of Yannick Sinner. So despite Sinner being 21 versus Alcaraz... Uh, 19, about to turn 20, right? His birthday usually comes during Madrid. Although there's that age difference, I still think Sinner has more development yet to come. More room for development. Next one is our Apple Podcasts uh, question. I appreciate all the nice words. My question for this week's mailbag, and this is from Adam, by the way, 
is what do you think Nick Kyrgios' 2023 season holds once he returns from injury? Additionally, what do you want to see him play? Oh, sorry. Who do you want to see him play? Uh, thanks for all the good work. You asked a very tough question there, Adam. You asked a very tough one. It's so hard to say. He, you know, he seems to, man, it's, it's such a wild card. Look, I've, I have nothing but great things to say about the level that he brought to 2023. I continued to kind of beat the drum of him being a top 10 player. I think especially... Although he played a limited schedule, I would say when he was playing, it was a top 10 level. I think he finished the year fourth in win percentage. I think that's a very valuable statistic, uh, especially for a guy who isn't playing week in, week out. It kind of gives you an idea of the rate at which a player like Nikiros is winning. His effort level was high. Physically, he was able to actually go week to week to week without breaking down and getting injured. Mentally, he was able to keep it together enough. There wasn't a lot of sabotage matches. When he was getting frustrated, he wasn't reacting to that in a way that got like tanky or, okay, forget it. I'm just going to implode and lose the match because of this. He was still getting upset, but he was continuing to compete through those things. So it was so good. It was so, so good. It was easily... I would... I would venture to say probably even more so than top 10. I think we could get into the top six-ish, top five-ish conversation with the level that Nikiros was bringing, especially to the grass court where I do think he was the true number two contender, actually number three, excuse me, after Nadal and Djokovic. I do think he was the true number three contender at Wimbledon. So if slash when Nick comes back from that injury, is he going to be that same guy? I don't know that. You know, he's only done it. What we saw last year, he did it for one year. One year. That's it. We've seen Nick Kyrgios on tour now for what? Broke out when he was very young. You know, 18, 19 years old. So we've seen him on tour for almost a decade now. And one year, he seemed to put in the work to get in shape physically, motivated mentally, happy off the court. One year, we, we've seen it. So are we going to see it again? That that's a big question mark. It's not a given, but man, it would be it would be great because I'm just thinking about what the tour has lost, and I know a lot of a lot of fans don't like him, you know, strongly dislike him. And man, he's given a lot of great reasons to dislike him. So I don't blame anybody who doesn't like him or doesn't want to watch his matches. But in terms of the overall large scale energy and entertainment he brings to the tour, it's a big hole. Uh, and I do think tennis is uh, is a better place with him in it. Even if you hate the guy, from a 50,000-foot bird's-eye view, I think it's very hard to argue with that statement. So, look, kudos to a lot of the guys who have stepped up here. Sinner, Medvedev, Djokovic, and Alcaraz, you know, who have been, who had incomplete seasons because, you know, no Nadal, no Kyrgios, there have been holes this year in men's tennis, at the top of men's tennis, and uh, it's been relying on some of those guys to kind of carry the mantle, step up, and bring some intrigue, and they've done a really good job, especially the trio in February and March, uh, especially especially Medvedev and Sinner, because that that was a little bit less expected, that they would step up and, and bring a lot of really highly entertaining matches. That said... Especially in, in Sinner's case, they don't bring anything similar to what Nick Kyrgios brings. It's a totally different thing. All right, let's get to the next one. It's from John. Hey, Gil, my question is, what's happened to Milos Raonic? He was consistent part of the top 10 for a while, even a top 3 for a couple days. Uh, why are we not hearing anything from him anymore? Will he come back? He was such genuine, interesting, with consistent results and inspiring characters. Miss him. Here's what I'll say about Raonic. If he were if he were retired, I think he would have said so. I do think he will be coming back. You know, and again, it's as simple as this. 
he hasn't said he's retired. If he were retired, he would have told us. He he would have told us that. So I don't think he's quit. And obviously it's physical stuff that's that's kept him out. And hopefully he's working through those things and he'll be ready to come back at some point soon. Next one is from Angelos. Hey Gil, now that Rublev has won his first Masters at Monte Carlo, do you think that he will be able to add more big titles this year and potentially win a few Grand Slams in the near future? Also, what do you think of Alexi Popper in this year? I think he is starting to become a more consistent player on the tour with the attacking weapons he has. I believe he can become a top 30 player soon. What do you think? Uh, all right, let's talk about Rublev first. I don't know how much I'm going to have to say about Popper. Unfortunately, I haven't really seen him that much uh, since the Australian Open when he was excellent with his big serve and his big forehand and just just managing the backhand a little bit better. But uh, yeah, he came through qualifying at Monte Carlo and beat Lajevic, who just beat Djokovic. So there's that. I'm not seeing any really explosively inspiring results. Uh, but yeah, he's climbing up a little bit. He was outside the top 100 when uh, when Indian Wells came around, and now he's up to 81 in the world. So good for him. Yeah, that's all I got on Popper. And, uh, Rublev. Look, I would love to be wrong about this, but my, my read on this Rublev Monte Carlo title is not that he's unlocked something that's going to that's going to vault him to a, a new level of men's tennis. It's going to vault him to the tier one level of men's tennis. It, it's not really how I see this. The reality is Andre Rublev has been knocking on the door for a very long time here. He has made two Masters 1000 finals. He has been a mainstay in major quarterfinals. He was in the year-end championship semifinals, advancing out of the group stage last year in Turin. He's, what, made the top eight three years in a row now? Looking like it'll be, well, I, I don't want to speak too soon. But this is a guy who was knocking on the door. And when he got to these matches, he was having issues playing as well as he can play. Because he just wasn't handling these big matches well mentally. Something bad would happen. He would get extremely down on himself. He would sulk. He would go away. And and that would be it. He would let, he would let the negative emotions avalanche. And he comes into this Monte Carlo final. He's playing at this time who, you know, someone who is not Djokovic, not Medvedev on a hard court, not Tsitsipas on a on a clay court at his best. Someone who at this stage is a little bit more flawed as a player in Holger Runa, who also wasn't 100% physically. And, and Rublev, heck, he's going to win this match if he shows up mentally. And he did. He improved, you know, the, the mental side of things and... And he, he he got he got there. You know, it was gonna happen for him. He was very, very close a lot of times. And this time, a combination of handling the moment better and also having an opportunity with the level of his opponent, he was able to get this thing done. Very well deserved, as I've covered. But I don't see this, you know, really new Andre Rublev. Now, the mental improvements, those perhaps can be sustainable, something that he can build on, something that he can now bring to the table consistently. But there are still some technical limitations. You know, he's still not the fastest player in the world. He's still not the best defender in the world. Uh, the second serve is still slightly attackable, but not as bad as it used to be. I think it, he has gotten better in that respect. Uh, the backhand was on fire, but I don't know if that was more of just, okay, he had a good backhand day, or the backhand has made some permanent improvements. Not really convinced of the latter. Still not a player who's going to bring all that much touch, feel, variety, transition game to the tennis court. So there are some technical limitations that I just don't think are going to be going away, and therefore, therefore, I don't, you know, to win the biggest tournaments in the world on a consistent basis, you're going to have to beat Djokovic and Alcaraz or or, or Nadal or Medvedev, uh, a healthy Tsitsipas. Rublev plays Tsitsipas very well, actually. But uh, in general, I don't think he's going to start doing that consistently. Next 
Let's go to the next one. It is from Casper. Oh my goodness. Casper's asking about Casper. Wow. Look at this. Hey Gil, my question is regarding Casper Rude. He has pretty made, much made all the biggest finals that you can reach in tennis, but hasn't stood a chance in any of them. I've seen him play some very good tennis that looks top five level, although he can't seem to break through and become a big threat at slams. What do you think he needs to do to become a bigger slam contender or what is limiting him at the moment? Confidence, game style, etc. Thanks for the five-star review. All right. What is limiting him? Well, in some respects, his ability to defend on the backhand and attack on the backhand. So I could just blanket statement that the two-hander, it's oh, it's not horrific. It's not the worst weakness in the world. You know, he hits a lot of RPMs on it. Uh, I can get it, and and that high bounce can protect it in a lot of ways. Uh, we saw it. I think particularly effective at the U.S. Open where he started to go down the line with a lot more confidence, started to take some more time away on the return of serve and develop some other options on that two-hander, shortening up the swing, enabling him to do that. But ultimately, I think the backhand isn't quite there. Uh, confidence is an issue. I think confidence is an issue. I don't think he has that main character energy, that swagger in the big matches. Uh, certainly, I think against Nadal at Roland Garros, that's, at this point, something that's accepted. is Even against Nadal, generally speaking, he tends to, he tends to shrink in these kinds of matches. I think he can, he can stand to develop a little bit more belief in those kinds of spots. But ultimately, you know, the losing in the big finals, it's not something that really concerns me in the sense that, and this is what I said after all of them, did anybody really think he was ready to win those finals? No, right? Like, who thought he'd beat Djokovic at the year-end championships? Who thought he'd beat Nadal in the Roland Garros final? Who thought he'd beat Alcaraz in the U.S. Open final? Nobody thought that. So, Rude had some good draws, especially at those majors. You can't get a good draw at the year-end championships, really. Uh, but especially in those majors, he got some good draws. He took advantage. Wasn't ready to win those finals. That doesn't mean that Rude has been on a hasn't been on a really good trajectory up until 2023 where some mistakes have been made, where he's made some backward steps. It's still very early on. Uh, we still need to see kind of how the year develops uh, because, again, he's got some time to turn the ship around. But I think until this year, the trajectory was really positive. Last year was a huge step forward. And frankly, he did not have the level or the pedigree to win any of those finals. So to me, it wasn't all that disappointing. Maybe the score lines, a tad disappointing, but not the results. From Caroline, what are your thoughts on tennis commentary? I feel often the commentary teams are discussing very general information about the players and fail to give the technical insight required on a point-by-point -point basis. Seems like they rely on the tech for that aspect. I would prefer a live commentary that tells me why a player netted a shot, uh, like Martina Navratilova or Tim Henman, uh, who give information about the position of the racket face, dipping balls, spin, or whatever else, and also more focus on analysis of tactics mixed with more general stuff. Often I feel like they are just stating the obvious, like, quote, he needs a first serve, or, quote, a chance to break. I appreciate there is a lot of time to fill, but still. Look, I can obviously go on and on about my philosophies about tennis commentary. Um, but to this, I will say it is hard. It is hard to analyze in real time. Like, I get the benefit on this YouTube channel of taking kind of a lot of time during a match and after a match to synthesize information to 
match the observations I made in real time with the analytics or the statistics that I that I have to work with after the match and try to piece together the puzzle. I have the advantage of being able to go back to key moments and rewatch things twice, maybe even three times if it's a if it's a really big moment. That's not uncommon that I'll go back and rewatch things over and over again. So there are some advantages there. It is hard to process these things in real time. Uh, there are also different different um, audiences for tennis, but I think in general, real talk. I think in general there is a lot of commentary, um, particularly analysis that that does cater a little bit too much to the casual tennis fan. Where I just don't think uh, the larger slice of the viewership is on that wavelength. So, I I think analysts who who really aren't afraid to go a little bit more into the the deep nuance and the nitty gritty. I do enjoy that a lot more. And maybe that's because of my background as a real aficionado of this game. A you know, someone who someone who just wants to be taught something. And the bar for that is somewhat high. Like you, you do have to go in a little bit of depth to to say something that that I haven't noticed or that I will find particularly interesting. Like there does need to be depth there. And I think most of the people listening to the, me right now or watching me right now, uh, you're in the same boat. You know, you're in the same boat. The bar is high for you. In order for somebody to make a point that that makes you think or that something that you really hadn't considered, it is hard. It is hard to get there. And that's the challenge that that I take seriously on, on this channel is to get to a point where you are super knowledgeable what knowledgeable about tennis. You know your stuff. How do I make it interesting for you? It's a challenge. Not easy. But I do think that's generally uh I don't know. Maybe there are maybe there is a lot of casual uh audience that, that does appreciate the more surface level stuff. But yeah, the the analysts that I tend to prefer most uh, do go into the most depth. Next one is from Henry. My question is, why do so many people mispronounce Alcaraz or Alcarath? He pronounces it Alcarath. Love the channel, but this has become a pet peeve of mine when people talk about Carlitos. Sure, I won't shy away from a subject like this. Uh, more tennis broadcastery talk. Why not? Uh, okay. First of all, it's interesting to me too that English speakers have not gone with Alcarath as the pr pronunciation of his name. And they haven't. I haven't heard it. You won't hear it on American television. None of my colleagues at Tennis Channel are saying Alcarath. I haven't heard, you know, anyone on the world feed say Alcarath. Uh, during the Aust Australian swing, I listened to a lot of Australian uh, coverage. Ha didn't hear Alcaraz, although he was injured, so maybe that's why. Pretty sure it's the same in England. So, it's not uncommon that the pronunciation of a name is going to be altered for, or I don't know, anglicized or just all altered for English speech speakers a little bit, you know, whether it, when it comes to certain sounds and accents that are not, not very common or easily accessible or commonly used with English speakers. That is somewhat typical though. The interesting thing, I think the best counter is like we did, we do use the same thing with Muguruza. That's a Z and I do hear sometimes Muguruza, but in general, the people who are pronouncing her name correctly are saying Muguruza. And if you could go with Muguruza, why aren't we going with Alcaraz? I don't know. I'm not sure. To me, it's counterproductive to be on an island on this. If I'm the only one saying Alcaraz, I think it's distracting more than anything. Uh, and 
I actually think the larger majority of people are going to be annoyed with that because they are getting used to hearing it a certain way. And if I'm out here, you know, being the only person to say Alcarath, I think that's distracting and bothersome. And I don't want to draw attention to how I'm pronouncing these names. I want to say them as correctly as possible. Um, but I also want to not be on an island with this kind of thing. So I think, first of all, Carlitos will probably understand that for Spanish speakers, it's going to be Alcaraz. For English speakers, it's going to be Alcaraz. And that's okay. It's probably not going to be bothersome to him. Knowing him and knowing how many other tennis players in the history of this game has uh, or have dealt with this same exact thing and not really had much of an issue with it. They have an understanding of it. Um, one of the big things, and, and this will be the last point I make on this. I know that for Russian names... English speakers tend to put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. I was speaking to a, a Russian friend. They were telling me that uh, Sharapova is Sharapova. Medvedev is Medvedev. But it's just not like that. Uh, English speakers will go with Sharapova and Medvedev. And if you are going to be the one to say Sharapova, you're just being distracting, honestly. You're just drawing attention to the pronunciation of a name where that should not really be what this is about. So if Carlito says, hey, uh, let's let's go with Alcarath, please. I would hope that everybody is going to be ready to make that adjustment and respect his wishes. Uh, but I think the way it is is okay. So sorry that it bothers you. I think it would bother more people if I personally started saying Alcarath. I think that would bother more people. Okay, next one from Spatula with Kurt. Okay, interesting. Uh, two questions about Alcaraz. One, I'm seeing more and more comments about Alcaraz being injury prone and people not expecting him to have a long career. For some reason, this isn't a concern for me. I think this is both due to the fact that a lot of his injuries are knocks and not long-term problems, as well as that he is able to recover and return to his best level almost immediately. I also think that his team can take time out of precaution. Can you talk about when you become concerned about a player's physicality versus when you don't? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, one of the common themes with Carlitos has been he has pulled out of tournaments this season, besides the Australia stuff. This season, he pulls out of Acapulco, he pulls out of Monte Carlo, both in spots where it made sense for him to rest. And that's why I say... Hmm, is he really injured? Because if he plays Indian Wells, I don't think he's really that injured. If he plays Barcelona, I don't think he's really that injured. Lo and behold, he plays both events. So that kind of showed you how severe those injuries were. Answer, not severe at all. I think there are two examples. Like one, it's obviously sample size. So like Matteo Berrettini now. Injured again. Very, very clear that this is what happens to him every year. That he's not really going to go a full season without getting injured. Not really going to happen. So part of it is sample size. With Alcaraz, the sample size of his injuries uh, is actually still very small. Concentrated. Concentrated in like a six-month period from the end of last year to now where there have been several issues. Only the ab... Well you know, the ab and the hamstring uh, being the most severe of the two. So sample size is is the biggest one. Uh, also kind of repeated areas you don't like to see. Like you don't like to see if a player continues to have the same thing. Del Potro wrists. Uh, Nishikori shoulder. You don't love that. Although some players are able to work through even repeated injuries, injury stuff. Uh, sometimes it's really not about like long-term injuries. Sometimes it's about do you wear down as tournaments progress. There aren't any hard rules for it, though. Aren't any hard rules for it. You don't like to see the soft tissue injuries. Like, obviously, a situation where a player has a freak injury, you don't hold that against him, right? Like, I don't know, maybe the most famous examples would be like a fan getting hitting hit hit in the eyeball with a tennis ball. It's like, all right. 
a player slips or something like that, you don't really hold that against them. So that's another factor. Let's go to the next one. Next one here is Carlos matches. Carlos's matches against Sinner in Miami and Wimbledon exposed his struggles in absorbing pace, yet it doesn't seem like he's done extensive work to be able to shorten his ground strokes when needed. I know that he's still in his tennis infancy, but this does remind me a bit of how Rafa struggles on indoor hard courts. Can you speak on the, spe the difficulties of working on shortening your ground strokes, especially when it's only needed for specific circumstances? Shortening your ground strokes is actually a development that I think almost every single tennis player who's ever played the game at some point has to do. There might be exceptions, but if you go to the top academies in the world and watch their 10-year-olds play and their 12-year-olds play, they're probably they probably have huge backswings, very very long they're overcompensating for a lack of physical strength. So I think, in a way, almost every tennis player has that phase of development where at a certain point, their swing was super, super long because they they were weak in the shoulders, weak in the arms, weak in the legs, and they just had to take massive cuts at the ball to develop uh, or to produce power. And as you get stronger, you start to shorten your swings more, hopefully. For some players, this might happen at 13 years old. And then for some players, I don't know, if you're Dominic team, it happened at 26 years old. But it's such a common, such a common hurdle of development. It's interesting. I don't know how much Alcaraz will be emphasizing it. That'll be fascinating to follow. I don't think he has his forehand is pretty long. You know, the take back is very, very high. I don't want to get into the nuance of trying to verbally describe his technique, but uh, it is pretty long. It is. So I don't know if he's going to try to tackle that or not, but I'm guessing he will at a certain point. Did I answer the question? I don't know. Speaking on the difficulties of shortening your ground strokes. It's tough, but it's very doable. I guess that's my point here, is that almost everybody does it. Almost every player does it at some point. Not to say it's easy, and I think the longer you wait to do it, the harder it is to do it, but we've seen a lot of players work on it and do it. This one for Mark. Hi, Gil. Can a player's backhand repertoire be hybrid of one and two hands? Two-handed backhands usually hit slice, volley, and drop shot with one hand as well. What if someone goes for attempted winners with one hand to exert maximum force and speed, but maintain two hands when in defensive or neutral positions for greater safety? Is this feasible or does training in one style already require massive investment of time and effort? Thank you for all you do. You're very welcome. Yeah, this kind of idea discounts how difficult it is to develop a world-class stroke. To develop a world-class stroke takes an astronomical amount of work and repetition. And to have to work on developing both a one-hander and a two-hander is a very, very tall task. Now, when I, re when I read this comment, I do think of my friend Jan Michael Gamble, who had a two-handed forehand but recognized that for some balls, particularly the return of serve when the ball was coming very, very quick and he kind of had to stretch out for a ball, or if he was simply on the dead run to his forehand and he had to kind of stretch out, he recognized that he was going to need to develop a forehand where he took the, the left hand off of it to hit a regular conventional righty forehand. So... He did do something somewhat similar to this. But in general, this idea does not intrigue me. The idea of having both a two-hander and a one-hander to be able to toggle between offensive and, and offense and defense in that respect. 
Uh, generally, I think what you would do is if you had enough time, you'd hit a two-hander. If you were rushed, sorry, other way. If you had enough time, you'd hit, you'd hit your big one-hander. If you were rushed, you'd hit your two-hander. Not only do you have to perfect both techniques, you also have to perfect the decision-making, which is you know, this split second thing that really has to be subconscious, human nature, and that can get very, very tricky. So the idea does not intrigue me, frankly. The idea of two forehands, lefty forehand, righty forehand, if you can, if you can develop proficiency in switching your grip fast enough, that idea intrigues me. That idea always has. And this is a, a weird take. It's a very weird take. And the reason why it's a weird take is because we're not going to know if I'm right or if I'm wrong until, you know, we might be flying around on self-driving cars through the atmosphere. We may have inhabited Mars by the time we know if I'm right or wrong. But I think within the next 50 years someone is going to develop a forehand on both wings because someone is going to be able to, again, master the art of switching the grip, which is really the only missing piece here. Um, and the reason why that intrigues me, obviously, is that the weaponry that you can bring and the weight of shot that you can bring on the forehand surpasses really what you're able to do on the backhand. And if somebody can hit a forehand off of both wings, it's going to give them an advantage there. I think somebody's going to figure it out at some point. And I know uh, there is someone, uh, there's a kid who I, I want to say is like 12 or, or 13 years old who has been able to do that and, and does a, an impressive job at it at this stage. I think it's like Teo uh, da, 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 Davidov, Teo Davidov or Davidov. So you've probably seen him like lots of viral uh, YouTube videos on him, but you can look it up. He does it quite nicely, but he's very, very young. Lots of development still to go for him. Next one is from Paul. We now have two world-class players in Medvedev and Sinner who have terrible backhand slices, but it doesn't seem to hurt them all that much. Is this shot less important in today's tennis than it used to be? And if so, why? Great question. First of all, they are really, really great at hitting their two-handers from a low contact point, even when they have to move inside the court to do it. And for Medvedev, it's rather remarkable that he's become so good at this because he hits a flat backhand, and it almost defies physics, which Medvedev simply does. I mean, lots of the things that... The fact that Medvedev can hit flat from the back fence and still achieve depth and precision, that defies all rules... Usually the further back you are, the higher and heavier with topspin you have to hit. Um, but Medvedev doesn't seem to have to do that. Same thing for how he's able to hit a midcourt ball from inside the baseline. And he can kind of figure it out. Now, can he hit that ball with a lot of pace? No. Do I think it's a good play against him? For sure. For sure. Uh, it's definitely a, a, a really good one. But because of his shot tolerance... What Medvedev will will do is he'll trade it quite nicely, and he'll remain unattackable on that ball. It does take him out of defensive position, but usually he'll be able to keep the ball deep in the court enough and hit the ball with enough quality where it's hard to attack him. And he'll go cross-court to the righty backhand generally. I do think he struggles against Rafa when Nadal goes short slice down the line as the lefty. I think he struggles. But Medvedev just manages it. It's not that it's not a good play to slice against Medvedev. It is, but Daniil manages it very, very well. Uh, Sinner is a little bit different. You know, he hits pretty heavy topspin for a two-hander, so he can get the ball up and down really well. I still think it's a good play against Sinner because he doesn't go down the line on it much. I think you can anticipate that he goes cross-court off of it. But you're right. It doesn't seem to hurt them all that much. Maybe it's because we don't have great slice backhands on tour. That really could be it. And when one comes along, an elite player with a great slice, maybe that would become a bigger issue. I mean, we we used to have, look, I think Nadal, Murray, Federer, 
all have great slices. Djokovic's is serviceable, and he probably should use it more against Medvedev. He does use it sometimes against Medvedev, I will say, uh, but he probably can use it more, even more than he does. Uh, but I don't know. These, this latest crop, they don't love mixing topspin and slice. Runa. Alcaraz, they try, they have backhand slices, but they don't really use it regularly at the highest level possible. And yeah, Medvedev, um, Sinner, let's throw in Rublev, let's throw in Fritz. Man, a lot of the top 10 doesn't have a backhand slice. I don't love that. I don't love that. Someone can come along and take advantage of that. I, I, I truly believe that. Oh, Tsitsipas. I didn't talk about Tsitsipas, who probably is the poster boy of player who should have a better backhand slice and doesn't. Next one's from Nathan. Hey, Gil, re-asking my question from the last mailbag. At the, I don't actually know how to say it, but at the uh, Banya Luka tournament, when asked who he would like to train, Novak mentioned Kyrio, saying he could have had five slams. It seems a lot of people think Kyrgios never reached his full potential. One of the best serves on tour and decent ground strokes. Uh, do you agree? I'm just going to add great hands, world-class volleys, uh, genius creativity. Do you agree with this assessment? Just wondering if there are players that have been on tour a while uh, you think could have been slam winners slash top five if things had gone differently. For the most part, not a lot. Obviously, Del Potro with the health. That's your, your biggest candidate. And then certainly there are players who I think could have been better. But I'm someone who has always kind of maintained that the lost gen, so to speak. Burdich, Nishikori, Sanga, Raonic, Gazke. Monfils. Um, I know I'm definitely... Dimitrov. I know I'm missing some players, but I was never in the camp of they should be winning slams. None of them. None of them should have won slams. Chilich got one. If he didn't have one, I wouldn't hold that against Marin. Even though, hey, I mean, he made, he made three major finals. I mean, good on him. But, you know, he could easily be... 0-3 in major finals and not have one. Like that could, there's an alternate universe where, where that happens. So I'm not a guy who holds holds it against any of those guys for not winning slams. At the end of the day, uh, they just did not have what it took to beat the big four in, in those big matches at majors. They, they didn't have it. So I don't hold it against them. I don't think that they're underachievers in any way for that. Um, you know, for Nick... The thing about Nick, everybody says that if I coached Kyrgios, he would kick ass. Yeah, everybody says that. The problem is he's uncoachable. So it would really take a special human intervention where Nick, you know, the challenge in coaching Nick would not be getting him to be disciplined, to be professional, to change his habits uh, before and after matches, to... Uh, improve his focus during matches, to improve his discipline during matches, to deal with some stuff technically that he's probably been a little bit too lazy to deal with technically. Yeah, every coach in the world looks at Nick Kyrgios and is like, yep, I'd fix that, I'd fix that, I'd fix that, I'd fix that. But at the end of the day, that would not matter in your ability to have success coaching Nick Kyrgios. Your ability to have success coaching Nick Kyrgios would be to open up the mind where Nick Kyrgios wants to be coached by you. And that is what nobody has ever been able to unlock. And it could be impossible. It might be impossible. But obviously Novak was having fun with the question and basically saying, I think Nick, uh, all, all Novak is saying here is, I think Nick is super talented. And if I coached him and he listened to me, then he would win five slams. But the end he listened to me and wanted to be coached by me part is a big part of this thing. I think Novak knows that. I also want to say that, and this is unlike me. It's unlike me to have such a 
I don't know, abstract take on things or off court, like it's very armchair psychologist, but I truly believe this. Novak would never admit to this. He would never admit to this. But I think Novak try, is trying to soften Nick up. I think he has been for the last year or so. Because there was a time where the relationship between Novak and Kyrgios was contentious. He went on Ben Rothenberg's co uh, podcast and Courtney Nguyen's podcast. Uh, no challenges remaining. And he was rude about Novak. He, he diminished his career accomplishments and... Didn't have kind things to say. So there was a time where that relationship was contentious. And Nick was a guy against the big three in particular. Notably not Andy Murray. He played them very well in part because he didn't respect them. He came out there, was not afraid of them, had zero respect for them. And played like it. He played like he didn't have respect for, for them. And it helped them. And I think as Novak started to recognize that Kyrgios was starting to turn things around and play really, really high-level tennis, I kind of think Novak was like, let me soften this guy up, butter this guy up, let's create this bromance. And that's a direct quote. I'm pretty sure Novak has used it. I think Nick maybe has used it as well, but there was this this shift where suddenly they're they're buddy buddy. Uh, now Nick standing up for Novak with the Australia thing is part of it, and part of that I think was because you know Nick was truly disgusted in his own country's COVID policies. Uh, but I feel like Djokovic thinks he can get a competitive edge from changing the relationship with Kyrgios. Because when you sap that vitriol and that kind of disdain that Nick can have for his competitors, I do think you take away some competitive edge away from Nick Kyrgios. He stinks against Andy Murray. Kyrgios has always not played well against Andy Murray. And that's because he loves, he loves Andy. He's an Andy Murray fan. They're friends. Nick is just, uh, he has a lot of um, admiration and reverence for Andy Murray. And he's never played well against him. I think Novak's smart. I think Novak sees that and is like, let's try to create that kind of Andy Murray vibe as opposed to a Nick hates me like Nick hates, I don't know, Stefanos Tsitsipas. And Kyrgios kind of thrives in that adversarial relationship with his opponents. Novak is stripping that from him. I think it's very smart. Maybe that's nonsense on my part, but that's kind of my read on it. From Max. Hey Gil, what does it feel like when one, your prediction is correct, but the justification of the, of the result was incorrect? Example, the match did not go tactically as you expected. Versus two, your justification and tactical analysis was correct, but th the prediction was incorrect. I'm asking this on the back of some people criticizing your recent picks. It's really easy to become a prisoner of the result and overlook tactical nuances in a tennis match. Thanks for the awesome content. Look, I, I could go long on predictions. I have so many thoughts on it. I have such an, a, a weird relationship with predictions. And I did make a, a quick YouTube short responding to one of the comments recently um, about my Monte Carlo predictions where uh, I kind of explained, or maybe I didn't explain this, but really what I was going for here was when I make bad predictions, which happens, happens to everybody, sometimes your predictions are crap. When I make bad predictions, it actually doesn't bother me that much when people give me a little bit of flack. It's still silly. It's still silly if you're if you have nothing better to do than to uh, you know, make fun of me for missing some predictions. But I really don't mind it at all because I agree with you. Like, yeah, oh, these predictions went horribly wrong. What does bother me a little bit is when my predictions are when I actually did a good job. And I still get comments that say I did a bad job where if you have any understanding of, 
I guess, probability in not just only tennis, but sports in total, you're able to recognize when someone is actually doing pretty well and when someone's not in terms of predictions. So uh, I get a little bit peeved slash ticked when I make, when I do well with predictions and still get hate because, you know, I'm up in arms. Um, and, and I know I appreciate all the positive comments, the everyone who's like, Gil, ignore it. Don't worry about it. You know, keep going. Keep, I, I hear all of you. I appreciate all of you. All right. And honestly, I don't, I don't spend enough time thanking you guys for all the nice things you say all the time in the comment section. I do appreciate it. Um, in my prediction videos, I spend usually about 90 to 95% of the time just talking about the tactical relationship and the circumstances of both of the players and the mental battle and the physical battle. I give my prediction at the very end for a reason. I'm trying to de-emphasize that part. Now, I, I know it's enjoyable for people. I won't stop doing it. I even know that some people like to hear my prediction and to bet on it. And that's okay. It's totally okay. In fact, those people, I don't think those people are giving me a hard time. Those people probably know how hard it is to get this stuff right. Because if you've bet on tennis, you've experienced it. I don't think it's actually the, the gamblers who give me a hard time. Um, so yeah, I mean, all that is fine. But there is a reason why I spend 90, 95% of the video not talking about what my prediction is. And at the end, I give my prediction. I give a quick justification. That is trying to tell you something. That is trying to tell you that I hope that the prediction is enjoyable for the reasoning. And not, not even the prediction is enjoyable for the reasoning. I hope the content is enjoyable for all of the things that I said before the prediction. And when the entire thing, sometimes it's a 20 minute video, 25 minute video, when the entire thing is reduced to the prediction at the end, it makes me resent the prediction part of it. It makes me resent it. It makes me not like it. Um, but I know, I know how many of you understand that. So I will continue to make predictions, but that's my, that's my relationship with it. That's why it, it is frustrating to put in all this work and then everyone always focuses on the last 30 seconds of the video, right? All right, let's go to the next one. I'll go an hour here. Next one is from King Nole. When will Sinner break out as a reliable champion of big events and which improvements he needs to carry out for it? Here's what I'll say about Yannick. He wasn't ready to do it last year. 2022 Yannick Sinner wasn't there yet. So I don't look at Sinner as someone who is overdue to win big titles. Maybe a, maybe a little bit overdue, but the sample size of him being ready to do this is really quite small. In 2023, you know, we're three and a half months in. Sinner has gone deep at many of these big tournaments, you know, Indian Wells, Miami, Monte Carlo. He's, he's on a, a huge run here. Uh, Rotterdam, ATP 500, right? Not not a 1,000, but still pretty big. Great field always in Rotterdam as well. And he hasn't been able to finish off any of those. But at the end of the day, he's losing to really great players. Monte Carlo is a tough scheduling spot, fatigue-wise. And that's why coming into the tournament, I thought he'd lose in the semis. So give him a little bit of time. It's coming. It's coming because now he's ready. But last year, year before, wasn't ready to do it. So if you have a timer on, on Yannick Sinner, if you're looking at your watch, your stopwatch, and you're saying, when is this going to happen? Your timer should, should be at about three and a half months time. Because before then, there, he just wasn't there. Physically, mentally, serve, movement, not quite, not quite there. From Gabriella. Hi, Gil. A WTA question. Who do you think is most likely to be the first to win a maiden slam between Anz Jabir, Jessica Pagula, and Coco Goff? That's fascinating. So, if you're going to say who is most likely to win a slam in their career, easy answer is Coco. With her age and how much time she's going to have to do this. How many cracks at it she's going to have. Uh, Pagula, 
is actually older than you would think. I think she's 27 or 28. And Jabur, similarly a late bloomer, I think, what is she, 26 or 27? She might be 28 even. Sorry, I gave a, uh, a big range here. I'm going to look up real quick on Jabur age. She's 28. Yeah. So Pagula and Jabur, much older. Uh, but at, at the same time, uh, they might be they might be closer to ready. Uh, Pagula, Pagula, I'm interested in for you know I guess for it would be Wimbledon or the U.S. Open, but really I think Jabur's peak level is higher than Pagula's. She is uh, a better sh offensive shot maker and is a little bit trickier I think for some of the the, the best players in the world. Pagula can can work some of those players into a little bit too much of a rhythm and uh, might be able to get, you know, might get overpowered by a Reebok, you know, or a Sabalenka, I think. Uh, does play, you know, did play Ego really well this year or has played Ego well this year. Overall, hasn't played Ego great, actually, though, for the career. So I don't know. Uh, my answer to this is Jabur. Most likely to win a Maiden Slam. You know, Jabur, I think there are a lot of questions making that Wimbledon final because the draw was so nice. And then she was the favorite in that final to beat Rabakina and didn't. But the U.S. Open, that was a nice run she put together there. It was. So, Jabur, hopefully she gets healthy this year, builds some momentum. And that would be my answer to the question. From Benjamin. Hey, Gil, thanks for doing a consistently great job with your channel. Thank you. You commented... Uh, Runa for staying back against Sinner in Monte Carlo. Although other courts like at Miami plays faster, do you think Alcaraz would benefit from dropping back a little against Sinner to avoid being rushed? He certainly has the physicality and the power to do so. Something to try. Now, Alcaraz has great and you know beautiful court positioning, fantastic footwork in the sense where he's very dynamic in his reading the game. Am I am I going to have to play some defense? Well, let's move back. Am I going to get a short ball? Well, let's move forward. So that's ultimately going to be what Alcaraz does. Could he benefit from a from maybe experimenting with defaulting to a deeper court position from neutral against center to give himself some more time against Yannick's power? I think that's a great idea, honestly. I think that's an excellent idea. From Ron Robbie. Hi, Gil. First of all, great job on the Monte Carlo predictions. See, there you go. Uh, you went pretty wild and got a lot of it right. My question is about our Monte Carlo champion. I couldn't help but notice that throughout the tournament, Andre has not been running around the backhand at all. This seems pretty strange because that he had all the incentives to do so. Great forehand, slow surface, unstable backhand at times. Do you think it's a strategy, technical issue, and have you seen this pattern before from Rublev? You know, it's not something that I really noticed. Now, I, I did notice that he had a disproportionate number of backhands against Runa. A lot of that was because of Runa's directionals. But I guess what I would add to this is uh, Rublev does not have quite what Tsitsipas has. Tsitsipas, first of all, I think has a, a weaker backhand than, than Rublev. Not by leaps and bounds, but by a, a decent margin, I would say. But the biggest part is that Tsitsipas has this elite speed, especially into his forehand corner. And that, in, that I'll, I'll use your word that you used in the comment, that incentivized Tsitsipas even more to run around his backhand because he often doesn't suffer the consequences of losing his court position. Rublev doesn't have that same speed and doesn't have those same defensive skills running into his forehand corner. So there could be a lot of benefit for Rublev in um, holding his court position and accepting more backhands. In other words, you're able to not get as far off the center line of the court by running around less backhands. And that puts less pressure on your movement. The other thing with Rublev is that, you know, he likes to take time away and take the ball early. And if you're going to do that, you have to accept more backhands because you do have less time to run around and hit forehands. And if you do, and it's not really, really good, now you're in even worse defensive position. 
Because now not only are you off the center line, but you're close in on the baseline. You're in an awful defensive position. So that might be an adjustment that Rublev made. And it might be them delving into the analytics and figuring out that too often he's losing points by actually getting himself out of position with the runaround forehand. Interesting observation. I really want to answer two more. I know I said I'd go an hour, but let's go longer. Uh, from Ghibli. Technical question. Changing direction, especially with down-the-line shots, is generally good due to being unexpected, giving the chance to expose less good shots and highlight movement issues. But I know Runa does this with more spinny, less hard forehands at times. Does it matter if these down-the-line shots are softer if, they, if they're if they still hard enough to ensure someone can't run around to hit a forehand? Example. I know this is probably a hard comment to follow, but I, I think I get what the question is. If someone has time on the backhand, is it generally still not a strong enough pace generator shot as long as it's from deep? So, okay. Let me try to parse this here. Basically, like, why is Runa going slow, spinny, high, down the line with the forehand. First of all, I do think it's somewhat matchup specific. He really liked that play against uh, Rublev and Sinner, who have very, very scary forehands. So I think part of it was just, let's make these guys hit and generate with their backhands. Runa overall was bringing a more patient mindset to the court. So he wanted to keep it onto the less dangerous wing and kind of work the point more, which was really good, really effective, especially against Yannick. Um, but that's a clay court play. Ultimately, what, what it showed me is that Runa liked that pattern. That is what I would call a pattern-changing forehand down the line, not an attacking forehand down the line, which, yes, to your point, is a little bit more comment, common. Common. You trade cross-court, you defend cross-court, you attack down the line. There are exceptions, but that is the basic pattern here. Um, so, when you go down the line without that kind of pace or without that offensive intention, you're changing the pattern. And ultimately what you're doing is you are probably going to generate a backhand cross-court more often than not. So if you like that pattern, if you like working that backhand a backhand, which I think Runa wanted against those two particular opponents, then that's the shot you need to play. I think it's as simple as that. On clay, it's much easier to do that because you have more time to redirect. When the ball is coming quick, it's going to be hard to go down the line uh, from neutral positions because you're going to probably make more mistakes. Um, and it's it's easier when you're deeper in the court as well. All right. Uh, from Will, my question is about team. Basically, what do you see from team? Is the forehand a little bit bigger and harder these days? Uh, yes, it is. I've definitely noticed that. It's uh, last two, three weeks, forehand looks bigger. I don't know. Yeah, I think we've seen some progress in the results as well. But I've been much happier with the pace that he's been generating on the forehand. Really, ever since that I said what I said about it being much too slow and not heavy enough. One from Pedro. What do you make of the recent chatter about the level of WTAs? Just about every top player enters most of them to the point they are essentially 1,000s in everything but name. Does the WTA need more tournaments to combat this or are things fine the way they are? Things are definitely not fine the way they are, especially the Middle East swing when you just had like standalone 500s. You had like, oh my God, you had like world number, the cutoff was like 29. So you were like the world number 30 and you were playing qualies. Not only were you playing qualies, but you were playing a three round qual qualifying. You had like, I think one matchup that I remembered. It was like Leila Fernandez against Karolina Pliskova qualifiers. Like, how is that in the qualies? That's ridiculous. It's absurd. It's not fine the way things are. Yeah, WTA needs to needs to think about those things. All right, last one. Last one, I promise. It's from Josh. Hey, Gil, I asked this a couple of weeks ago and would be interested to hear your thoughts. 
What are some head to heads which are more one sided than they should be? Obviously, there are bad stylistic matchups, but Medvedev being 6 0 against Sinner got me thinking about this. So I saw this comment, and honestly, it's really hard to rack my brain off the top of my head and to kind of think of these weird head to heads. But I did know someone who would have um, who would have these in his I don't know, I I don't think in his brain, but in his notes, certainly. And that is uh Vanch uh Verbani, Vanch 2K on Twitter. So I DM'd him and he gave me a, a little list. So I'll read the list to you guys that he gave me. Nishioka 6-0 against Dan Evans. Dan Evans 4-0 against Hachinov. I think that has a little bit to do with the slice backhand. Burdich 12-0 versus Kevin Anderson. That one's wild, folks. Uh, Anderson 7-2 versus Team. Struff 6-3 versus Shapovalov. Gaz K 6-2 versus Kyrgios. Gilles Simone 6-2 versus Chilich. Davidenko 6-1 up on Nadal on hard courts. That one's well documented. Ferrer, 15-1 versus Almagro. And then a couple on the WTA. You have uh, Vogelov versus Stevens, 4-1. Uh, and Brengel versus Kvitova, 3-1. That is strange. Brengel, Kvitova, 3-1 is strange. Although Brengel has such a such a wild game. I could see some players really hating it, hating to play against it. Okay, among all of those, what's the weirdest? What's the one that makes the least sense to me? It's got to be Burdich 12-0 versus Kevin Anderson. That's the one that makes the least sense to me. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.